Hi, welcome to the Virtual Connection. I'm glad you're with me today. I want to get your Bible and turn to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. We're going to, um, I've been reading this psalm for several days and was going to share it with you today, and there's just so much in it. It's going to take more than a day. Uh, I think it's going to take me uh, maybe all week to cover everything. Of all the psalms in the entire psaltery, this is one of my all time favorites. This psalm is very practical and extremely relevant for us today. The reason this chapter is so practical and relevant is the fact that it gives us insights on how to get up when we're spiritually, when we've spiritually fallen down. The same insights tell us how to stay up day by day. This is why it's been called the, the sinner's guide. And, uh, Maybe that's why I want to share it. I guess I don't have any insight into your lives, but I uh, do on mine. So the background of the psalm includes David and Bathsheba. David has been involved in sexual immorality with the beautiful Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. Uh, David has seen to it that Uriah would be killed in battle so he could take Bathsheba as his own wife. Some Bible scholars believe that almost a year after these initial events, Nathan the prophet confronts David about his sins, an event that's recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 12, uh, the first 13 verses. The consequences of, of that confrontation uh, were David's conviction, his confession, his desire for consecration, and revival in his own life as expressed in this prayer of David in, in Psalm 51 and what a prayer it is. Well, here's what happened when David saw Nathan and Nathan confronted him with his sin. David responded and said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. That's in 2 Samuel chapter 12, and that's verse 13. Now, as we go through this prayer, looking at David's heart and, and desires. We're gonna find important steps on how to get up when we have spiritually fallen down. Why is it important to get up um, spiritually in the first place? Well, I, I think that the, the, the first logical answer is our example has an impact on so many people. Being a hindrance to others in their spiritual walk is a very serious matter to God. Romans 14, 13 says, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. There was uh, quite a mix up a few years ago at the U Duke University hospitals in Raleigh and uh, Durham, North Carolina. The Associated Press told the stories back in 2005, actually sometime in November 2004, and they told the story in 2005. Maintenance workers had um, drained hydraulic fluid from the hospital elevators, and for some reason put the fluid into empty detergent drums, and they didn't get rid of the drums. Through a strange series of events, the drums were mistakenly redistributed to the people who cleaned surgical instruments. It took two months and 3,800 surgeries before anybody figured out something was wrong. Now, washing the instruments in hydraulic fluid uh, was not an effective means of sterilization, I wouldn't think. But the biggest question is, what kind of damage had been done to the patients? No one was sure what the petroleum residue might do to people. The hospitals, you know, head honcho, assured the public, we want to give the people the message that we care about our patients. And no doubt they did, and no doubt they do. But if their instruments weren't safe, they were a threat to their patients, no matter how much they cared. Listen to me, gang. The same truths hold for those who claim Jesus Christ as their savior. We may care greatly about people, 
But if we're uh, living in sin, we're hurting the cause of Christ and setting a bad example for other people. The decisions we make may influence others to follow us into the life of sin that could end up destroying their lives. That's why it's vital that if you or if I have fallen into sin or we've ever gotten away from the Lord, that we get back up spiritually and get back on track, lest we continue to lead others astray. This chapter offers principles on how to get up when you have fallen down. And it happens to all of us. There are times we just fall. We don't mean to, but we, we fall. We, we stop praying like we should. We stop reading the word. We stop fellowshipping. And we have to see where it leads. Well, here's David's prayer. It starts in chapter 51, verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God. According to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. I love that prayer. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Like the sting of a scorpion, David feels the, the painful sting and guilt from, from what he's done to himself. What he's done to others, what he's done to God, his heart is crushed, his heart is broken by the guilt and the weight of his sins. Don't be fooled. Remember what anybody says, man. Sinful living is very painful. Job 15, 20 says, The wicked man travails with pain all his days, and the number of years is hidden to the oppressor. Psalm 107, 17. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. Proverbs 13, 15. Good understanding gives favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. David gets right down to business and deals immediately with his transgressions. He doesn't excuse his sin, doesn't try to justify what he's done, doesn't pass the buck, doesn't blame everybody else. There is no, Lord, if I have offended you, please show me, and I am so sorry. He openly acknowledges his wrong, doesn't beat around the bush. Hear me, if you have fallen into sin, and desire to get back up, you need to have the same attitude about what you have done. Because until you take responsibility for your actions, you will not get anywhere spiritually. You have to take responsibility. So King David seeks the mercy and the compassion of God on his life, knowing he doesn't deserve it at all for what he's done. His sins are, are many, and so he seeks a, a multitude or abundance of, of tender mercy. Thank God the Lord is not cheap in mercy. There's a multitude of it. His mercy is new every morning. If our sins are in number as the hairs of our head, God's mercies are as the stars of the heaven. As he is an infinite God, so his mercies are infinite. David says, and he's praying, he says, Lord, because of the greatness of your mercy, blot out, wipe out, obliterate, exterminate my transgressions. He made this plea to the Lord, for he's the only one that can blot out our sins. No one else has that ability or has that power. Our only hope is in the Lord. And David realized this fact. We must realize this also. If we are wanting to get back upon our spiritual feet, we have to realize that we are responsible. Let me tell you a story. I um, heard this story a long time ago, but it touches me every time I think about it. Many years ago in Detroit, Michigan, the well-known evangelist, Dr. Charles Finney, preached on 1 John 1, 7. The blood of Jesus Christ God's son cleanses us from all sin. After the service, a stranger came up to Dr. Finney and asked if he would walk home with him. Advised against it by the church officials who knew the man, Dr. Finney went anyway to this man's home with him. Ushering the preacher into the river building, the stranger locked the door, 
put the key in his pocket and says, now, now, sir, don't be afraid. I'm not going to hurt you. I just want to ask you a few questions. Do you believe what you preach tonight? Dr. Finney said, said, I most certainly do. The man continued. Well, we're in the back of a saloon. I am sole proprietor, sole proprietor. Mothers come in here, lay their babies on the counter and beg me not to sell liquor to their husband. I turn a deaf ear to their cry. We see to it that when a man leaves here, he's so well under the influence. More than one night, a man leaving here has been killed by the express train at the tracks. Dr. Finney, tell me, can God forgive a man like that? Dr. Finney replied, I have but one authority, the word of God, which says, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. The man continued, he says, but sir, that's not all. In another room over here, we run a gambling hall. If a man doesn't spend all his money on liquor, we bring him back here and with marked cards, see to it that he is fleeced out of his last buck. We send him home penniless to a hungry family. Dr. Finney, I am sole owner. Tell me honestly, can God forgive a man with a heart like that? Again, Finney replied, I have but one authority. The word of God, which says the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son cleanses us from all sin. The man spoke again. That's not all. Across the street is my home where I live with my wife and little daughter. Neither one has had a kind word from me for five years. Their bodies bear marks of my brutal attacks and beatings. Dr. Finney, do you think God could forgive a man with a heart like that? Dr. Finney's head lord, his eyes filled with tears as he said, my friend, you have painted one of the darkest pictures I have ever gazed on, but I still have one authority which says, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. The man opened the door, ushered the preacher into the night, then never left that room until daybreak. Not before ripping up decks of cards, pouring the contents of liquor down the sink. Across the road at home, he went and sat down in his living room. His little girl cried, called out to him, Daddy, mother says breakfast is ready. When he answered his little girl kindly, she ran back to her mother. Daddy just spoke kind to me, something is the matter. The mother followed her little girl to the living room. The man beckoned them both over taking one on each of his knees, he explained to their amazement that they had a new husband and a new daddy. He ended, I'm done with that business across the street. The man later became a member, then an official in the leading Detroit church. When asked to tell how his life was changed, he would reply, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses from all sin. I've told that story a few times. It touches me every time. John chapter one, verse 29 says, the next day John sees Jesus coming and says, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Ephesians 1, 7 says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. King David's desperation for forgiveness is reflected in his request for mercy. The words he uses increase in intensity as he, as he appeals to the Lord's mercy. First he says, have mercy upon me. Mercy denotes that kind of affection which is expressed by moaning over an object we love or favor or pity. It's the natural affection and tenderness which which beasts of the animal kingdom show to their young by the several noises they respectively make over them. David says, Lord, just have pity on me. David continues his appeal based on the loving kindness of the Lord. 
Lord, I not only need your mercy, I, I so need your loving kindness. Loving kindness denotes a higher degree of goodness than the, uh, the word mercy. It, it denotes a ready, large, and liberal disposition to goodness and, and faithfulness and compassion. Powerfully prompting to all instances of, of kindness. It is kindness that flows as freely as water from a, from a fountain. David's plea, Lord, I, I need your abundant goodness and compassion. Oh, brothers and sisters, family of God, we need it too. Lord, we need your mercy and compassion, your loving kindness. David doesn't stop there. He then continues asking for tender mercies, has the idea of a deep, tender love and compassion that comes from the innermost being of a person. It's a love that a mother has for her baby in the womb. It denotes the most tender pity, which we signify by the moving of the heart, which, which argues the highest degree of compassion of which nature is susceptible. David asks God to hide his face, face from his sins and to blot out his transgressions simply based on the Lord's mercy. The metaphor about blotting is, is taken from the custom of wiping a clean dish or keeping accounts where a debt is paid and the charge is blotted or canceled. David's revolts and excesses were all recorded against him. But he asked the Lord to erase the lines. And I, I kind of paraphrase what I think David was saying. Lord, draw your pen through the register. Obliterate the record, though now it seems engraved in the rock forever. Many strokes of your mercy may be needed to cut out the deep inscription. But then you have a multitude of mercies, and therefore I beseech you, erase my sins. That was David's plea. If you have fallen and need to get back up, ask God for his mercy. Ask God for his forgiveness. Confess or agree with God about your sinfulness. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I, am he that blots out your transgressions for my own sake and will not remember your sins. Oh, what a promise. I, even I, am he that blots out your transgressions for my own sake and will not remember your sins. And then 1 John 1, 9, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're just gonna put a comma there. We'll pick it up tomorrow at verse two because I just wanna to talk to you for a minute. I believe God wants to do a work in all of our lives. There's so much going on in the world around us with this pandemic, with the demonstrations on the streets, with the uh, terrible things that we've seen that breaks all of our hearts, um, needless, needless deaths, uh, so many things that need to be changed. But here, let me tell you something. As believers, as Christians, our hope is in Jesus Christ. We just can't change things on our own. And I'm, I'm convinced that as we surrender to Jesus and we are the men and women of God that he's called us to be, things will change. We need to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. We need to be those who love and embrace. We need to be those who encourage and, and pick up the pieces. We need to be those who are honoring others better than ourselves. We need to be those who, when people look at us and see us, they see the truth of Jesus Christ. They see who he is by the way we live, by the way we talk, what we do. And if we're not doing that, then we're, we're having a very poor witness to the world. I believe a while back our, our nation decided to tell Jesus just to leave. We don't need you in our schools. We'll take the Bibles out. Uh, we'll take prayer out. We don't need you at our events. We'll take prayer away. We don't need you in the courtrooms. We don't need you in, 
in various things. And um, I believe now we're reaping what we've sown. And um, we all know this verse so well. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. If we want to see our land healed, it needs to be you and me as believers turning from our wicked ways and becoming the men and women of God that we have been in the past that we should be. Men and women of prayer, men and women of integrity, men and women of the word, men and women of faith, not just in word, but in deed. Um, I believe we'll begin to see what we're supposed to do. I've talked to so many Christians recently. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't know what, how, to, how to appease people, how to do this. I don't think that's our role. I think our role is to surrender to Jesus, ask forgiveness for any sin or any way that we have failed him, be filled fresh with his Holy Spirit, allow his power to live on in us and through us so that we can give the world the real answer. The real answer is not just changing what we do. The real answer is changing who we are, becoming new people in Christ Jesus. If any man be in Christ Jesus, whole things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And we need to have that message. Pray with me, would you please? Our gracious Father, we sit before you and many sit before you today because I've, I've, I've asked that there would be many listening today that we need to get up and ask your forgiveness, repent, turn from our wicked ways. We need to have the same determination as David and cry out for your mercy, cry out for your, your grace, your loving kindness in our lives. Fill us fresh with your Holy Spirit, please. We surrender to you this, this night, this day, fresh to you. We surrender to you. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Well, we'll be back tomorrow at the same time. We'll uh, pick up at verse two, probably go a little farther than just one verse tomorrow, but there's so much in this chapter that um, I want us to, it to become part of our lives, that we won't forget this chapter. It's not just a chapter we'll run through a 30 minute Bible study, but it's a chapter that we will digest all week. And when we need to remember, we'll remember this chapter. And reapply it to our lives when necessary. God bless you.